Okay, Luke chapter 2, and we're reading from verses 21 onwards. I'm going to read it out. You can follow me. The title says, Jesus presented in the temple. Verse 21, on the eighth day when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus. The name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. Do you notice the word before he was conceived? It's not like they came up with a name after. It was before he was even conceived, the angel said, name him Jesus. Verse 22, when the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Verse 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought the child Jesus to, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and he praised God saying sovereign Lord as you have promised you now dismiss your servant in peace for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel the children's that the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your soul too. Verse 36, There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phineal, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had, lived in her, she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child. To all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. Verse 39. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord. They returned to Galilee. Their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. And he was filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. You know today as I read this text. The question that grabs me. Is why these two. Out of all the people in Israel at that point of history, why? Why does God choose these two people in the autumn years of their life to be the ones to announce and proclaim who this baby is? Why is it? And I think the writer of the text, we can see here that it's Luke. I, I think that he wants us to ask that question. Because he puts so much detail about Simeon and, and he puts so much detail uh, about Anna in the text. He puts it there so we will ask that question. And he even puts in there qualities that he sees in their lives. And I got to thinking about this. If you have a look at verse 25, some qualities that we see in Simeon's life. When you run your finger down to verse 25, it says this. Who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the cons consolation of Israel. And when you run your eye down to verse 37, and it's talking about Anna, it says this in verse 37, it says, she never left the temple, but worshiped day and night, fasting and praying. 
And uh, what I notice about these two people that God chose to use, both were very God centered. It was significant that God chose two very God centered people. They were people who had a hope in their lives. They were people who had a, a dream, a longing that God would break into history at that moment in time. You know, they were significant people. If you have a look at verses 25 and verse 38, let's do it again. It's, it, it even emphasizes uh, about them. Look, at verse 25, it says this. On Simeon's side, it says, he was waiting for the consolidation of Israel. When I was, uh, when I was looking at that word consolidation, what, did it, what does it mean? It's like when someone dies, you come and put your arm around the widow. and you cons it's, a, it's a comforting. And you've got, you got Simeon, you've got Israel, you've got the Romans. They're oppressing the people of Israel. They've got them under their thumb military-wise. And Simeon's got this dream. He's got this dream that God is going to break into history and he's going to set people free. And, and Anna, 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 verse 38, she's the same. It says here, um, coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and she spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. See, both these people are significant. God recognizes something in their life. He sees that they're waiting to receive the Christ and he starts to use them. And you know, I was thinking about Christmas. I was thinking about Christians, in fact, us, and how we are going to behave at this Christmas time around our family and around our friends and about the gatherings we get into. And are we like Simeon? Are we like Anna? Do we have a hope inside of us? Do we have a longing for God to break into our family members, those who will be around us? Maybe for you this Christmas, it's your brother. For me it is. Who doesn't know God yet. He, he doesn't see Jesus yet. Maybe for you it's your lost son. This Christmas. Maybe for you it's your hurting daughter. Maybe for you it's Uncle Tommy who's the alcoholic in your family. And you're going to be around him this Christmas. Maybe it's Cousin Julian. She's a she's an atheist. Right, right across the Christmas dinner, man, she's telling you how useless God is and Jesus is a nobody. Maybe for you this Christmas it might be your mum. Or your dad. For me, it's like that this Christmas. Have a look at verse 27. It says, Moved by the Spirit, he went. And I was thinking, well, what's the right thing to do around Auntie Julie? What's the right thing to do around Uncle Tommy when he's on the Terps this Christmas? The right thing to do is to be moved by the Spirit. Don't speak before the time is due to speak. Don't speak too long. Just when the Spirit moves you, that's the time to move. I'll tell you exactly how you'll know when. If you listen this Christmas deep inside, you'll hear this voice. It'll go like this. Da -da -da -da. It's like now. Move now. Gently share now. I, uh, in the years leading up, I have uh, had a tradition that on New Year's Eve, I go on the street and I go maybe to Oakura or wherever there's a big crowd of people. In fact, New Year's Eve on uh, Y2K, I didn't go to sleep. I stayed up all the way, 24 hours through the night telling people that I met uh, about Jesus. And several years ago, I remember being on the street and 
I, people are so drunk on New Year's Eve. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah, to actually hold a conversation with someone and they're dribbling all over you and you're trying to tell them about, about the Savior. And sometimes it is just a hopeless course. It's just terrible. And I was leaning against the lamppost this one night and I was thinking, this is a despairing course on the street of Taupo. And then I just had this caution. It was just like, pray, wait, and just share with the people I tell you to share with. You know, verse 27, moved by the Spirit. And I leant against this lamppost, and I paused, and I just, just gently steadied and quieted myself, stopped the, the run, 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 that racehorse temperament, just settled it down. You know, and then this kid walks past. He's all of 16 years old, and, and God says, he's the one. Go share with that kid. So I'm looking stupid, man. Like I, I'm getting past him, walking up the street. I'm ahead of him now, and I, I pull out my magic tricks. You know, I could, I won't do it here today. You pull out my pink and blue magic trick, and hey, have you seen one of these? And man, I already know I want to talk to this guy, and I was actually over there, but now I'm ahead of him, so I can sort of get in his life, and and I start telling him about Jesus, and he says, "You can't tell me nothing about God." He said, "I know." My dad's a pastor. I, I'm a backslidden PK kid, you know? And uh, all that kid needed was a gentle guy like me to gently impart into his life that music. I didn't tell him what a sinner he was, how he shouldn't be here, he should be here. I just come along the same as I want somebody to come along, one of my kids. Just gen people who are pastors' kids, they don't need a big lecture. They don't need it ramming down their throat. They just need someone quietly and gently to come and tell them about the Savior, to come and prompt them, hey, you really need to get your life back online with God. And uh, that was a significant time in sharing with that young man. Can we have a look at verse 34? Cast your eyes down there. It says this, it says, Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your soul too. I read a commentary this week, and it said this. Jesus is the only person who we cannot say, I have no opinion about this man. You do have an opinion about Jesus. I tell you, you cannot be neutral around the man, Jesus Christ. You have an opinion. You ever have an opinion that makes you rise, or you have an opinion that makes you fall. There is not one of your family members this Christmas who does not have an opinion about Jesus. You cannot be neutral about Jesus. He doesn't give for that. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said to Simeon. Simeon wouldn't have said to Mary, this child, it's in his arms, you know, this baby, cute. And Simeon's going, this guy, He's going to make people rise, and he's going to make people fall. He's going to reveal the hearts that are deep inside people. And I'll tell you, you cannot be neutral about Jesus. And it's the same for us this Christmas. And yet, qualifying this. I'll tell you, you and I, as we enter these Christmas meals with family, as we hang out with workmates, as we go into this scene of Christmas, you and I are required to share the good news of Jesus Christ in a way, in a way that leaves a good taste in the mouth of the person you shared with when they walk away. Oh, if there was a way I could recommend you to do that, would you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3 
and verse 15. <laughs> 1 Peter 3, 15. Verse 15. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. I know if you go into this Christmas, you got Jesus as Lord of your life. You get up every morning, you go, make me a blessing today. You already did that. You set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Oh, I, I ask you guys, get ready to tell the Christmas story to the people who will engage you this Christmas. But I tell you, do it with gentleness and respect. Talk to anybody who's not a church person and, and ask them what it's like to come across a self righteous Christian who's always right, always proud, their way is the only way. Ah, they'll tell you it leaves a bad taste in their mouth. You can take the same message and deliver it to the same person with higher levels of humility in your own life and it will go deep into the soil of those people's hearts. It will go so deep. You can take the same message Put some anger on it, some frustration on it. Show them that you're right, they're wrong, they're sinners, you're going to hell and they're going to hell. Look at your messy light. Oh, look how many beer bottles are, you know. It's the same message. Do you know you can be right and yet wrong in the way that you are right? It's so true, isn't it? Do you know that's, that's why it's saying here, always be prepared and then it qualifies here. But do this with gentleness and respect. You know, when you're at the Christmas table, you don't have to have the last closing statement to prove to them that you're right and they're wrong. You don't have to put... It doesn't, the world doesn't end this Christmas day. You'll see those people again. You know, I'm just... I just want to head home. Uh, we have a message. We can leave a good taste in people's mouth. And we can just do it gently. Sowing seeds. As you hear that. Da -da -da -da. Wait. Pray. Listen. Deliver the message gently into people's lives this Christmas. I know for a fact that you will walk into family times this Christmas. And there will be offense there. Uh, he will cause the rising and he will cause the falling. There will be offense at some people here. There might be your brother who said something back there and he did that and she did this. Guys, if I could encourage you in interrelating with the community and family this year, go after, as, uh, go after offense to get rid of it as far as it's within your control if we got a pie graph and it's this big and this part is within your control to fix it go after that bit don't try and get them to fix this part because you know what the root of all unforgiveness is i'll tell you what it is it is the right to punish otherwise you just release them to go when somebody hurts you and you hold unforgiveness, you're holding it there because one day you'll punish them for what they did. Or you'll punish them for holding back your emotions, your feelings, your kind words from them. And yet, oh, we're called. We're called as people of the light to, to let offense roll off us. Martin mentioned a verse a few weeks ago. It is to the glory of God to overlook an offense as you go into christmas guys let a fence roll down your back and uh, freely give forgiveness to those who don't deserve it don't punish in any way because god hasn't punished you and i i was thinking about making the sermon practical and the truth is sometimes the heat comes on sometimes Stuff is really starting to crank in the kitchen. 
Sometimes it's just really starting to build and build and, and there's tension starting to build. Practically, advice, take a walk. It only takes 10 minutes to go for a walk. You think, why is there so much competition in the kitchen this Christmas? And you realize, oh, I'm competing with my sister. We're competing. She's trying to cook food and I'm trying to cook food. And she's trying to, and we're all being Martha's, you know. And uh, it only takes a few minutes to take a gentle walk, maybe with your husband or your wife. and Just think, ah, what's really going on here? And walk, walk through it. And um, sometimes it just takes a little bit of rest over this Christmas time where we're not just crazy, where we can just settle, go lie down, just rest. Uh, often, if you stop and pause and feel the feelings through and think the thoughts through, you can dismiss a whole bunch of stuff. This week, I was on the foreshore and there was a guy in a Hawaiian van there. You know, one of those escape campers and... and uh, Bruno's his name, and I got talking to Bruno, and I was listening inside for, God, do I, do I preach to this guy? Do I, do I invite him home? And so I say, hey, Bruno, you want to wanna come home and stay on our lawn? He goes, yeah, yeah, okay, in his spoken French, you know. So we invite this guy home, and then um, by the time it's Tuesday, the police are, uh, we're in contact with the police, and the detective's sitting at my table, and I'm going, what in the fact is going on here? And Bruno had picked up the hitchhiker from Hawara. No harm done by Bruno. But he took the hitchhiker, put him in his van, drove him in, dropped him at New Plymouth. An hour later, he's with coming out to my house, you know. And the next morning, the tourist, uh, the, 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 the boy from Hawara, dead. Dead on the street, Devon Street, dead on the ground. And uh, when the detective's talking to me, he's going, do you know anything about synthetic cannabis? Do you know anything about this? Do you know, well, do you know what Bruno had in his van? Do you, do you know this or that or this? Or... And uh, man, we're going through this. God, I, I took that guy dirt bike riding Monday morning. We were fat. And I have the video. I said, I'm going to put this on YouTube file where he craps off my 250 and plasts himself all across the grass. And, and we were having a great time thinking, this is out of character for Bruno. Bruno, in my whole time with Bruno, there was no way that he was malicious and would go murder a kid on the street. It just didn't line up. The post-mortem come out. The kid was alcohol, intoxicated. Devon Street, you can see it at stuff. Fell eight meters. Bam. Dead. One life wasted all because the young boy didn't take heed to his alcohol consumption he is not here anymore his parents will be grieving and i tell you this story because alcohol and christmas they often go together they do in uh, in my family circles and for the young guy who died tuesday he died because he misused alcohol. He is not here anymore. And, you know, as you head into Christmas, I tell you the story because I, I didn't think too many Christians got drunk and stuff, you know. And I used to be a car mechanic and I was sitting at Midway Motors and there was this guy I really respected and he was a prophet around Taupo. And, uh, and he said to me, you know, I'm, I'm working on a tire machine or whatever, and he says... Um, Rex, I only, uh, only get drunk once a year on Christmas Day. He says, I just keep it to once a year. And I just, and I, you got to remember, I'm only 17 years old. And I'm trying to stick that through my grid. You know, dude, the Christians just get drunk once a year. And I had to go away and think, well, he's a prophet. I know this guy is significant man of God in Taupo. And he's telling me as a 17-year-old, well, I, I, I'll be just, one day, yeah, it's Christmas Eve, and I, man, I get on the turps, you know, down in White Trail, around my family, that's what we do. Is it acceptable? As you roll into this Christmas, man, I'll tell you, you get around the family, 
can all go wrong real fast. Bam! It can be DIC, it can be your driver's license, it can be your job, it can be harm to other people. You can say lots of stuff out of your mouth when you just have one too many this Christmas. And uh, I, I just want to encourage you as you head into this Christmas, um, keep a close eye and, and just measure the effect that that is going to have on your life as you roll into this Christmas. Would you turn with me back to uh, Luke chapter 2 and we'll just finish off here in verse 29. It says, Sovereign Lord, said Simeon, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. I notice in the autumn of this guy's life, he's older. I notice that he says, Lord, you now dismiss my life in peace. He's in the autumn of his life. He's not going, God, give me two more months to live. Maybe one day you go and see him begging here for more time to live. You see a man who's got a hope for eternity. He has. He's got inside of him an eternal perspective. He knows the moment that his eyelids close for the last time, he will go to be with Lord God Almighty. He has eternity stored in his heart. He says, you can now dismiss me in, in peace. And I notice the, the saddest people that I meet, by far, by far the saddest people I meet are the people who don't have a hope for eternity. And you'll know it. You'll know when you meet somebody like this because they're trying to stuff their life with stuff. They're trying to stuff their life with possessions and they're trying to live the most experiences they can and stuff it all into this life because at the grave there is no more. They don't have a hope for eternity. But I'll tell you, folks, Simeon. Simeon saw what the baby Jesus was all about. Jesus it says this about Jesus. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know, in Jesus Christ, when you have Jesus in your life, when you've repented of your sin, you've received the Savior into your life, in him all your sin is washed away. Not one not to every sin you have ever done. Not because you're good. Not because you made amends for your past. It's because Jesus Christ took the full punishment on the cross for your sin. And Simeon knew it. Because he had a peace for eternity. He could say to God Almighty, he said, God, you can dismiss me in peace. You could hear the rest all over his life. Do you have the same rest? It's ours. It belongs to us this Christmas. If you have Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, it's yours. You have assurance, not according to your behavior, but according to your faith that you have been saved by the grace of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray today that you would um, give us a hope to uh, pronounce to our families. That you would give us a message and a right standing to live right and communicate right around about our families this Christmas. I pray that you'd give us the right um, caution on alcohol to have it in the right place in our life and keep us safe from danger around those who misuse it this Christmas. And I pray that you would move us by your spirit like you moved Simeon. Go now. 
speak now. You moved Anna. Go now, speak now. I pray that we would hear that da 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 inside of us. Speak now. Now is when you gently share. And with gentleness and respect, would you help us to carry forth the message of Jesus Christ this Christmas. In Jesus' name. Amen.